Jim Napalm, uh, leader of the hormones since 1985. Uh, originally started in Corpus Christi, Texas when I was 19 years old. Then we moved it up to Austin, Texas in 1991 and had, uh, aside from a 15 year break, uh, we've been going strong since 2012 again. When I was like 12 years old, I guess, I got excited uh, when the Sex Pistols came to America and I was seeing them on the evening news and, you know, Walter Cronkite was talking like this was the end of civilization and that sounded like a cool thing to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it took, uh, I could have seen the Sex Pistols in San Antonio when I was 12, but my parents were not going to let me go to that. So, um, six months later I got to see the Patti Smith group, summer of 78, at the Ritz Theater in Corpus Christi, Texas, and that completely blew my mind. For one thing, I was raised in a very fundamentalist Christian background, and you know, Patty at one point says, Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. What the? You can say that? And yes, you could. Yes, you could. Um, hearing the Sex Pistols, um, first two years I owned that record, I couldn't understand a word Johnny Rotten was singing because of that accent, yet I understood perfectly well what he was singing. I could get that he was saying things that were going on in my mind, you know? And in the summer of 1979, I saw The Clash on their second American tour. It was essentially the London Calling tour, and they were playing the Armadillo World Headquarters in Austin. And that was the night I decided I want, this was what I wanted to do. Uh, it was just, they were, you got the feeling, it was the only band I've ever seen ever that you got the feeling you were getting something more than a rock and roll show. It, you were getting, you were learning about life, you were learning about how to walk, how to talk, how to comb your hair. By the way, you ought to hear this music called reggae, and oh, by the way, your government is not being honest with you. Here's a few books you should probably read. That was the kind of the sense that you got when you saw The Clash. Um, and they forever became my idea of what a rock and roll band should be. Um, but, you know, I, this is a long ways of going about this. Essentially, you know, I started playing guitar when I was 14, started writing songs about the same time. Wasn't able to get a proper band going because I was living in a small Texas town until, you know, very late in my teens when I was entering college. Um, I ended up becoming one of ten people that basically started the punk scene in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, ended up moving to Austin after college, and when I was in college I started writing for fanzines called like Flipside and Alternative Press and various other magazines and uh, that in became the way I paid my rent because uh, unless you're Green Day you cannot pay your rent on punk rock I'm afraid. Um, so you know ended up reforming the band in Austin. We were going about nine, eight years we start we, had, we put out three singles did some compilation appearances, made several attempts to record, do an album that never got off the ground. A bunch of this material is collected in what is finally belatedly our first LP called Legendary Jump, which I'll be happy to sell you tonight, or you can go contact us through a GoFundMe campaign we've got going. And that's $15. Just came out in Australia. Uh, we were broken up for about 15 years. Re I 
moved around the country and uh, did a lot of different things. Finally, came, when I came back to Austin in 2012, people were bugging me to reform the band. I'm the only original member left, but, you know, I started the band and I'll finish this band. And all I want to do now is do all the things we never got to do the first time around. I want to tour the country, come visit people, like, you know, in cities like this, you know, and make more records and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if you want to know what we sound like, I always say we're exactly what um, would have happened had the, new, had the Clash gotten Johnny Thunders to front them in 1978. Um, those are the two bands that inspired me the most were the Clash and the New York Dolls. Well, I came back to Austin for a reason because I realized that was home. Austin's changed a lot from when I was a very young man. It's gotten gentrified. The entire world is getting gentrified right now. The 1% are squeezing the rest of us out onto the margins, making it very hard to live, you know, at least in a cheap fashion. That's going to make things very hard for, hard for the artistic. You need to have cities where you have cheap living, you know, where you don't have to worry so much about the rent. You know, where you don't have to work three jobs in order to pay for your crappy little shoebox apartment and, you know, get a pawn shop guitar or something. But, um, or, you know, paints and canvas or whatever it is you're working with. Um, I like a lot of different places we've, I've played and lived at. Liked New York City, I was there for five years. Los Angeles I liked a lot. Um, you know, um, but you know, Austin is home. That's hard to narrow down because as a songwriter, you know, you want to spread the love out amongst all your children. These songs are your children, you know? Mm. Um, the one that people a lot of people think is my best song. I'd be hard pressed to disagree, although I think I'm still writing good songs, at least I hope so. It was a song called Julie's in Love that I wrote 20 years ago. It literally, like all the best songs I've written, it came flying out of the blue. Um, and it literally was written in the time it takes to play the song. I mean, words, chords, Melody, everything, the arrangement presented itself whole in my head, which all my best songs have done, like Sell Out Young, which was our first single, like Burn Victim, like, and Julie's in Love was definitely one of those. And I was playing it in the living room, and at the time I was living with my then bass player uh, in South Austin in this rent house that we found, and he was getting ready for work. He was in the shower. And he heard me playing this song in the living room. And he comes out and he says, what 60s pop song is that that you're playing? I said, it's one I just wrote. And, uh, you know, that's, I don't know, I think a lot of people can just relate to that because it's like, you know, it's about you have these feelings for someone that you just can't express. Why can't I open my mouth and say Oh boy. Well, I'll tell you one fucking thing that this generation needs to learn. It's that music is not free. Okay? You need to understand that artwork, art, needs to have sponsorship. You know, we can't eat our songs. We can't pay the rent with our songs. It costs us money to make records, okay? Stop illegal downloading. Go, or rather, 
If you do do that, use that as a guide to figure out what record you're going to buy. Okay? Um, and come out to see live bands. Okay? Um, and just in general, I see a lot of people making music for all the wrong reasons, and I blame American Idol for this. Because, I'm sorry, this is not a talent show. You have no guarantees of becoming a rock star and wearing bling and getting your fucking mansion and your drug habit, okay? You know, if you're going to make music, make it because you have to. You know, make it because you have no choice but to make this music. It has to come from here, and from here, and from here. Facebook.com forward slash sellout young is our Facebook page. Reverb Nation, I think, is. Uh, I forget what that, I think it's ReverbNation.com forward slash Tim Napalm. Um, Twitter, Twitter.com forward slash The Real Hormones, because there's a few bands out there that when we were gone tried to use our name. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, man. <laughs>